Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we'll be asking six historical questions that you do not know the answer to, or at least I don't think you do. If you do, let me know in the comments. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking, let's get started with the first question. When did they start naming streets? Well depending on where you're from, one of the things that we sort of take for granted is the fact that our streets, avenues and roads have got names. But how far back in the past would you have to go to find the very first instance that it's documented of people actually naming streets? Would we have to go all the way back to, I don't know, the early modern era? Perhaps the medieval period? <laughs> Wrong. The first attestation of proper names given to streets are from the Akkadian context, dating back to the second millennium BC. In the tablets of the Sippar archive, various documents of a public and private nature report the names of the city's streets, and accounts that mention the taxes owned by an individual named Sin Remeni describes him as a resident of the Akitum Street, which could be translated as New Year's Feast Street. That, from its name, could have been the processional street that connected the temple of Shamash with the sanctuary outside the walls. Some of the streets in this city were named after deities or gods, and one of the reasons could be the fact that perhaps a sacred building dedicated to said god would be present in that street. For instance, once again in Sippar, we have a Nimin street, an Ishta street, and an Lamashtu street, all attested. In our day and age, a lot of the streets that we get are named after either like famous people, literary writers, important historical per uh, people, politicians, kings and princes. But one thing that happens in this specific case, which we don't really do anymore in our time, is the fact that some streets will be named after either someone who will be taking care of the maintenance of that street, I know, right, or a prominent individual who owned property in said street. In a property location document, a house building is described as adjacent to the house of Su Ninsun and also to Su Ninsun Street. So, did you know the answer to that one? No? Well, check out this other question. Who invented the first ship slash boat? The first archaeologically documented watercraft is the Pesse Canoe, a small boat found in the Netherlands and dated to the Mesolithic period, roughly between 8040 and 7510 BC. Take a moment to consider how long ago that was. Considering the chronological period and the place of discovery, the creators of the Pesse Canoe must have belonged to the genetic group called WHG, meaning Western Hunter Gatherer which populated Western, Central and Southern Europe during the Mesolithic era. As an extra fun fact to help you imagine these people, the Western hunter-gatherers belonged to a specific phenotype which had dark hair, light eyes and dark skin. The Pesce canoe must have been made with horn and flint tools, carved from a single Scots pine trunk, and for this reason it is defined as a monoxylon vessel, from Greek meaning made of one single tree. The dimensions of the boat are 2 meters and 98 centimeters in length and 44 centimeters in width. Yeah, I mean it's a little too small for me and I wouldn't try and cross a river with that, but then again, even though this is also the sort of sentiment that some scholars had, sort of questioning the actual water capability of such a very basic vessel, it was proven. They made it and it works. Smart Mesolithic bastards. A reproduction made by archaeologist Jap Boker and tested by professional canoeist Mark Jan Jan Dielemans, no idea how to pronounce it, has proven to be capable of navigating in a river environment. Nice. Okay, next one. When was the first bank opened. There you are. I see you getting ready to go to your local bank to withdraw some money to buy this absolutely beautiful and intact sealed copy of F-Zero for Super Nintendo, but guess what? Banks weren't always available, but when did it all start? Well, get ready because things are gonna get interesting, but before we go all the way back to the very first historical account of something that could be even considered a sort of prototypical bank, we need to talk about the Knights Templars. Yeah, you heard that one, right? I need a helmet. There I have it. Look at this beauty. Hey, you can tell me anything about my presentation style, but I've got good props. The Knights Templar operated a primitive form of banking in the 12th and 13th centuries. That's because the Templars accumulated significant wealth through donations, bequests, and their own economic activities. This allowed them to develop financial services. Pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land could deposit funds at a Templar commandery in their home country and withdraw the equivalent sum upon arrival in the Levant, avoiding the need to carry money on the dangerous journey. 
This was an early form of traveller's check. The Templars also made loans, although the Catholic Church's ban on usury meant they could not openly charge interest. Instead, fees and rent on mortgages and rented properties provided a form of disguised interest. Templar commanderies operated independently but were linked through messengers and a primitive system of letter of credit, forming a loose network of financial institutions across Christendom. Templars also acted as treasurers for some European monarchs and nobles administering royal finances and arranging international transfers of funds. So even though they did not make banks in the modern sense, technically, the Templars still begin and innovate at some of the systems that we still find in modern banking today. All right, that's impressive, but it still doesn't answer our question. What's the first documented case in history of something that resembles a bank? Get ready for it. The first structures that combine the activity of deposit and lending, the two characteristics element of the banking system, are the temples that emerged in the ancient Near East within the Sumerian culture. The ability to have large warehouses well defended both materially by robust masonry structures and by the sacred role of the temple initially made the temples a place of deposit for resources such as grain and metals. The institution of tablets functioning as genuine letters of credit allowed for a fluidity in the transmission of wealth between creditors and debtors. In particular, the temples of the lunar god Sin and the solar god Utu seem to function as true banks granting loans at interest rates. This activity of temples functioning as banking institutions flourished in the subsequent Babylonian period. And in the center of Sippar, the economic financial activity was carried out by the so-called Naditu, which was a type of Babylonian priestesses connected with the temple of the god Shamash, the Akkadian version of Utu. And do you know exactly what a Babylonian Naditu is? Well, I certainly didn't before starting the research for this video, so allow me to elaborate. The Naditu were a sort of younger daughters of high society who were forbidden to marry and have children. Their name encompasses the Akkadian meaning of to leave uncultivated. And some scholars have associated them with the prerogatives of nuns in medieval Europe, just to give you a little comparative perspective. Now, usually coming from noble and wealthy families, a famous Naditu, for example, was Iltani, the sister of the king of Babylon, Hammurabi. The Naditu had substantial resources that they employed in various activities, managing the provisions of loans in barley, silver, and raw materials through the temple. We can therefore state that if indeed the first banks and their system were born within this temple society, then the first bankers were women. Okay, next question. What is it like? Question number four. I always lose count what a professional YouTuber I am. But if you're having a great time as much as I'm having a great time, don't forget to subscribe, become a noble one and click the notification bell. Next question. What's the oldest university? Perhaps whenever you think of students going to university to study, getting books, trying to get degrees so that they can get a good job, you kind of think that they're that's something modern, but it really isn't. In fact, there are so many universities that are still operating today that go all the way back to the medieval period. Say, for example, the Università di Siena, founded in 1240, the University of Cambridge, 1209, the University of Salamanca, Madrid, 1134, l'Università Federico II of Naples, 1224, and of course, the University of Oxford, which you were expecting me to say, probably founded in 1096, the date still being sort of debated. The University of Oxford is kind of important and I do want to focus on it a little bit before I give you the final answer of what the oldest ever university is in the world. But there are a few things and a few dates that are important to mention when talking about universities. 1167 is when the rapid growth in student numbers after King Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris. 1188, the first known foreign scholar at Oxford. 1190s, Oxford referred to as a studium generale, sort of a precursor word for the term university. 1231, first official university charter granted by King Henry III. 1249, first official statues of the university recorded. 1264, Walter de Merton founded Merton College, establishing the collegiate system. Now, all of this is once again impressive, but Dear Oxford, you're not the oldest university ever. In fact, the oldest university ever still in operation, I've got my phone here because I don't know how to pronounce it, just gonna try it, is that of Al Quaraviyin, 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 in Fez, Morocco. Appreciate if you let me know how to pronounce this because I'm gonna butcher all the names in the next section. In 859 AD, along with the foundation of the mosque, a madrasa was born, that is, a school dedicated to both legal and religious disciplines and the study of sciences. The foundation is attributed to a woman, Fatima al-Firiya, 
originally from the Arab tribe of, okay, I'm not even gonna try, this Arab tribe, the clan of the city of Mecca. According to the historiographical work, the paper rose by historian Ibn Abizar, Fatima was an educated woman, well versed in theology and law. After the death of her father, a rich merchant, followed by the premature death of her husband, Fatima decided to invest her inheritance in the construction of a center that would be both a beacon of faith and culture. The University of al Karawin thus predates the birth of the oldest Western university, that of Bologna, founded around 1088 by a jurist of Germanic origin called, in the sources, Irnerius. Next question. All right, we talked about university, banks, ships, all these things are important, but can you go one day without wearing socks? I know your answer is gonna be yes, but my answer is gonna be no, because I'm from the Mediterranean, I'm always cold. But who invented the first socks? And most importantly, how ancient of an inventions are socks, literally. Well, we've got an interesting mention in the Greek author Hesiod in the poem Works and Days, written in the 8th century BC. He writes, On your feet wear sandals of ox hide, and beneath cover closely with the piloi. The Greek term pilos in Greek generally indicates felt, compressed wool, and by extension also a particular conical hat made of felt and by analogy the simple bronze helmet, particularly dear to the Spartans, of a similar shape. The plural word that we just heard Hesiod use is therefore usually interpreted as a reference not to the advice of padding the sandals with felt, but to a real garment to be identified as the first known type of socks. 8th century BC, that's 2,800 years ago for socks. And I'm not done. Who knew that there was so much to say about socks? It's the Metatron channel for you. The first archaeological evidence of socks, however, comes from the Roman and Gallo-Roman context and relates to the garments made of woven wool. In this Gallo-Roman female burial, dated to the 2nd century AD, long cloth stockings were found. Then, in the famous wooden tablets found on the site, known as the Windolanda tablets, they are indicated with the name Udones in Latin. If you're not familiar, the Windolanda tablets are a remarkable archaeological discovery that provides a fascinating glimpse into everyday life in ancient Roman Britain. The Windolanda tablets are thin wooden leaf tablets that were used for writing notes. They were discovered at the Windolanda Roman fort along Hadrian's Wall in northern England. The tablets date back to the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. There are over a thousand tablets that have been found so far. They were written in a carbon-based ink using cursive Latin. Many of these are military correspondence between officers and family members discussing personal matters like, for example, good health, legal issues, and, you guessed it, make sure you wear your socks because it gets cold in Britain. Mums never change. That's why the Windolanda tablets provide an unprecedented window into the mundane details and first-hand accounts of people's daily lives under Roman Britain. Now, this specific type of sock is present in several examples in Roman Egypt and their workmanship, not exactly crochet, but which involved knotting the weft while using a needle, is called Coptic stitch. Very similar to the sort of workmanship that will become characteristic of the Norse world in the Middle Ages. Before moving to the last point, and God, I'm gonna go out on a banger, I do want to commend everyone who has made it so far. I really appreciate it, but I know you're not here for socks. You're here for weapons. So weapons it is. How old is gunpowder? The very first reference to gunpowder comes from a Chinese text dating back to the late Tang Dynasty, or Tang Chao. The title of said text is usually translated as essential elements of the mysterious way of the true origin. In Mandarin, Zheng Yuan, Miao Dao Yao Liu. Yeah, I had to repeat that a few times. Zheng Yuan, Miao Diao, Zheng Yuan, Miao Dao Yao Liu. The work being attributed to a mythical Taoist alchemist who lived in the 3rd century AD, but in fact, most of the text refers to 850 AD. The text lists several alchemical formulas and attempts to create the elixir of long life, and among these, the formula of what is defined in Chinese as Huo Yao literally fire potion, a weak gunpowder that, as an elixir, turns out to be a definite failure and also dangerous. What seems to have happened is that we know that in ancient China there were several alchemists that were trying to create the concoction, an elixir that would give eternal life to their emperor. I mean, we know that ancient people, particularly those in power, the one thing they couldn't buy was, of course, eternal life. And we know that the Chinese specifically sent people on all sorts of travels, even all the way to Japan, trying to find these potions that would grant them eternal life. But what we read in this text is that as they were trying to mix several types of ingredients, they ended up 
Well, not creating an elixir of eternal life, but definitely creating something that could take people's lives. Let's check out these ingredients. It turns out that if you mix sulfur, arsenic sulfide, and saltpeter, mixed with a little honey, for good measure, I suppose, the result was smoke, so that their hands and faces were burnt, and even the entire house was burnt, apparently. Initially, this Huoyao seems to find applications in the field of entertainment, specifically in the creation of firecrackers. But when it comes to the first military application of this Huoyao, it appears in the Chinese text known as Wu Jing Zong Yao, complete essentials for the military classics, which dated between the second half of the 1900s and the first decades of the year 1000. In this text, which I'm not going to pronounce again, a particular arrow is mentioned, the fire potion whip arrow. This was a large dart that was launched with a staff sling. It was propelled with a tube with five ounces of this Huo Yao. In fact, a sort of rudimentary rocket, if you will. In this text, which I said I'm not going to pronounce again, there is also another type of bomb, in fact, an incendiary bomb that is mentioned, the Huo Qiu, literally fireball. Just to help you imagine this, this is a sort of a ball made of many different layers of paper mache, papier mache, I don't know, I just pronounced Chinese, don't get on me with French as well, and inside this, it was filled with gunpowder and launched against the enemy. We also have another type of bomb called Thunder Bomb, which was a bamboo container in which gunpowder was present, and its explosion was intended to rather frighten horses and spread chaos in the enemy ranks, rather than cause actual damage. There was also a variant which involved attaching blades and caltrops to the papier-mâché, not so much to spread metal shrapnel, as one would imagine, for an hypothetical explosion, probably a rare event, but to ensure that the incendiary bomb would firmly plant itself on a wooden surface, for example, enemy siege machines or enemy ships. Would you add a fate hao? If the first black powder weapon seems to be substantial incendiary projectiles, instruments of psychological warfare or propulsion spears between 1100 and 1200, the Chinese invented the actual true shrapnel bombs, no longer made of paper or bamboo, but of iron. The casing of these bombs were filled with pressed powder, and in the annals, known as the history of Jin, the explosive effects of these bombs are described, which, upon detonation, hurled red-hot iron shrapnel all around. Nasty business, you really wouldn't want to be at the receiving end of such a bomb, or any bomb for that matter. Alright noble ones, but if you enjoyed this list and the answer to these questions, please let me know in the comments below and let me know if you had heard of any of these before the watching of these videos, and of course, don't cheat. Please give me a like and share this video and we'll be able to continue find these very interesting little questions in history and prepare more of these videos and perhaps post them more frequently on the channel. But as always, thank you so much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye.